Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we are going to start this session. Uh, thank you for being here. So this session is on sustainability. Actually, the title is Sustainability, uh, the impact on research and institutions. And behind this title, what I wanted to do is have some kind of discussion on uh, what does it mean, sustainability, first of all, uh, in science, in the world of science, um, and these institutions that manage science, and uh, how is it viewed in, um, from uh, three different angles. So we have uh, three guests. Our first guest, Olivier Dangles, uh, cannot be with us, uh, but he recorded uh, his video and his presentation. And uh, so we are going to start with him, and, and then we'll carry on uh, with uh, Anna Jesus and uh, Lucy Swan that uh, are here that I will present afterwards. Hello everybody, uh, thank you for the invitation and sorry for not being present uh, with you today. My name is uh, Olivier Dong, I am uh, the Deputy Chief Science Officer at the French Institute for Research and Development and today I would like to talk to you about why we need sustainable science and how an institution, the IOD, has implemented this science. So basically I, I like to represent sustainable science and to define it uh, using Kate Werewolf's famous uh, a donut uh, where you can see here uh, this green belt which is between uh, the, the planetary boundaries, climate change, ocean acidification, uh, biodiversity laws that we don't have to exceed and the so social foundation of the humanity which are basically the needs that everybody has to, uh, to be allowed like social equity, gender equality, energy, water or food uh, access. And so sustainable science is basically finding sustainable solutions to live in this green belt which is um, a socially just and environmentally safe space. So I like to, to, to remind why it's really useful to have this kind of sustainable science uh, to, to think about uh, the world and the different countries in the world. And uh, where you place the different countries on this axis where you have uh, on the x-axis the exceeded planetary boundaries and on the, on the y-axis the social threshold reach, then you can basically see the developing countries and developed countries uh, where the developed countries have an access to the different threshold, uh, social threshold, but at the same time they completely exceed their planetary boundaries. So the model is not really from being from developing towards a developed countries, but basically it's to go towards uh, this corner here, which is the, the really challenging co corner about sustainability. And so everybody, the developing countries and the developed countries, share the same issue and the, and the same challenge of finding sustainable solutions. So when you try to think about systemic science and you do a literature review, you have uh, several keywords that pop up from this uh, analysis and you can basically uh, try to solve them um, between three keywords. The first one is try to understand basically the social ecological system, the adaptation to climate change, the vulnerability of population. Uh, another group of words is about co-designing uh, the solution. So you need some interdisciplinary research. You need to think about uh, the methodology, the evaluation and how you can uh, kind of of, uh, have a reflection about the epistemology about uh, the different terms in systemic science and then you have another branch which is about uh, transforming the system and so there you need some transdisciplinary research that means go beyond the academic knowledge and also think about education and innovation. So basically, I would like to now try to illustrate how at the IOD uh, in my institution, we have tried to address this kind of sustainability science challenges with our researchers and um, all the most with our young researchers. So first, uh, we try to think about uh, how we can implement the sustainable development goals. Then we want to reflect about the role of science in policy maker making. We want to think about also the ethical partnership with uh, the Global South and finally, uh, we try to have a reflection also about the social contract of our researcher with society. And so I'm going to develop uh, these kind of four key points here now in uh, my presentation. So about sustainable development goals, we tend to have in our mind like the 17 sustainable 
development goals, but what is really important in these goals are the 169 targets. So you can see here the different goals uh, classified between uh, what is about the people, the planet, uh, the property and the peace and the partnership. But really what we need to think about are all these uh, bars here in the middle of these um, uh, graphics where you have the 169 targets that really are he helpful for uh, the political side and the scientist side to try to uh, develop a common intent to uh, guide the research and, and, and guide the, the impact of the research. And basically, we need to be more aware about uh, trying to explore different sustainable development goals at the same time. Here you can see how sustainable development goals have been implemented more and more over, over the time. But basically, the green plots here are about one SDG at the same time. And so what we need is to have a, a broader and a more integrative view about how we can implement the different SDGs at the same time. And this is what we need to do as researchers. For example, this is a, a nice example about how the different SDGs can be uh, implemented and how they have to be thought about. For example, the mosquito net, which is uh, a very uh, useful um, innovation to fight uh, against malaria. Uh, actually, they have another side effect, to, which is the illegal fishing and the over-mortality of some fish of, uh, in some region of Africa. And so you need to think about uh, using the mosquito Nate, uh, in a sustainable way, that means that you need to, at the same time, protect the health of people, but also not uh, to have a, a negative impact on fish populations. As a second issue, what we try to do at RD is to try to deeply think about how we do science and how it can be used uh, for policy making. I like to use this kind of bridge images, which is come from the Irving paper in Nature Systemity, where you can see here the knowledge, which is basically, so this is what we tend to do before. We had the knowledge in the university, in the ivory tower, where we have some differences between science, humanities, engineering people. Uh, and on the other side of the bridge, you have the needs by the population. Uh, and basically what we tend to do before is to, okay, we're going to do some knowledge, some kind of knowledge, and we're going to transfer this, we can transfer some tools to the needs of the population, and there will be a kind of magic wand here that uh, the results of the researcher will be uh, used. But what we see most of the time is that we waste a lot of knowledge, basically, on the, on the, on the scientific side, but also we, let, we lose the, the knowledge that pe the people can also have uh, in the society, in their territories, and all the ideas. And so the idea of sustainability is science, what we try to do now is to try to co-design the knowledge. That means that the researcher, you see that they try to become more interdisciplinary, more a convergent research, and then they're going to beat people uh, on this bridge, so they're going to beat also the ideas of the people, and they're going to co-design a research. So that means that you need to think about a different way of doing research. There have been a lot of literature uh, these uh, last years about how to do this kind of uh, meeting of the people and the researcher uh, on, the, on the bridge. And basically what you need is that you need to have a common goal. So you have to co-design your goal and to, to know that you're going to go to the same direction. Then you need to have a context. Uh, most of the time you need to have a territory or you need to have a region or something very concrete to implement the solutions. Then you need to be pluralistic in your approach. That means that you need to recognize both the different uh, knowledge in the university, uh, humanities, science, engineering, and also to recognize the local knowledge. And then you have to be interactive. You don't have to say, okay, this is my research and this is my objective and, and I have to stick to it. You need to be really adaptive and, and, and you need to be able to develop another way of uh, achieving uh, solutions if there are some changes uh, all over the world uh, in, the, in, the, in the implementation that you need to have. And so what we try to do at the IRD is to implement some new communities, some community of knowledges, uh, where we have different kind of knowledge that are uh, within the same group. So people from humanities, people from um, uh, basic science, and people also from the society. And they try to meet together. Here you have, for example, a, a picture from the Sustainable Cities, which is one of the nine community of knowledge that we have at the IRD. And we try to implement a new way of doing some research, a new way of creating knowledge. So I think that we need more and more about these communities that are rich in that are that are based in one territory here it was in Tunisia for example and that think about co-developing knowledge 
what we try to implement also at the IRD are some uh, convergent labs uh, where we try to have on a map. So here, uh, this is the, the, the international laboratory that we have all over the world and we try to have some ethical partnership with the South to do this kind of implementation. So basically here you have the icon of the different um, laboratory that we have in health issues, in uh, geoscience issues, in biodiversity issues. And what we do is that we co-design with people from the Global South uh, and we co um, head also all these laboratories and we try to have a conversion science here from the different part of the, the of the academy and also from the society so this is basically to think about uh, the different problem that there is on a territory together and then to converge and to have people having with different uh, expertise converging with uh, towards one territory so this is a kind of flagship uh, program that we have at the IRD and and we tend to have a lot of young people and students to be involved in these laboratories uh, so basically what we try to do in these laboratories is to we try to implement the different SDGs, the systems of development goals, and, and you can see that there are interactions that are implemented within the laboratories. And also what we try to have is really to cross the different disciplines within the academy. So here you can see the different uh, laboratories that have some intersection between humanities, um, um, engineering people, and also uh, basic science people to try to have all this new knowledge which is created. And also we have uh, a JIRA, the ID uh, to the Research Finance Initiative, which is a kind of um, global initi initiative for the institution to be able to implement some kind of fair way of doing some research. What about the social contract? This is really something in, in, important. Uh, this is the cover of the science magazine like two years ago when uh, it was the uh, election between uh, Biden and, and, and Donald Trump. And for the first time, the uh, uh, science magazine um, took the voice and, and, and came into the political debate and um, saying that uh, people had not to, vo to vote uh, for Donald Trump. And so then they were criticized uh, for doing this, the, the editor-in-chief were criticized, and he defended himself in, a, um, in, a, in the, in the um, newspaper, in, in the science uh, journal, uh, saying, a reader who don't think science and his publishing peers should write about politics often tell us to stick about science. And uh, they say that, well, okay, we stick to science, but more importantly, we're sticking up for science. And I think that this, this was something really courageous from the editor to, to do the, this kind of um, uh, declaration in the in the magazine. Uh, then you have also researchers that are very uh, involved in trying to defend uh, the, the planet, and they feel a bit uh, hopeless about this and about how, as climate scientists, for example, that can help to make cha things changing. So here you have some researchers that have been uh, involved in sticking their hand on a car here just before the COP uh, climate uh, last year, and, and there were one uh, from the IOD, for example. And also, uh, we need to think about the fake news. Uh, the spread of the fake news are really much faster than, than the, the news from um, scientific um, base. So we need to think about how, as a, as, as a community of researchers, we need to uh, try to combat all these fake news. And there are also uh, new activities, for example, to have some new meeting framework that are more inclusive, uh, that are more inclusive to be on all continent with different genders and uh, equity, and also with low carbon. So we try to think about a way of doing some different science and a way of having more our social tr contract to do this. The social contract can be also about uh, uh, not doing only research which is sexy or flashy, but also research can, that can be useful. And for this, you, we need to measure the impact of our research. And there are more and more uh, initiatives also to go towards how we can uh, think about the impact in research, how I, we can write, for example, as academics, impact CV. And also, we need to think a bit more about the excellence question. What is really the excellence in uh, uh, the academy? What we need, mean about this? Is this only the academic excellence or is it also to have an impact and to co-design with society? So I think there are some very interesting issues to be thought about uh, in terms of how we do the research. Okay, so basically, here are my take-home messages to uh, start uh, with this uh, uh, introduction. One is that the SDGs and their targets are really useful to implement collectively uh, sustainability science. 
my second message is that we need to question how we do research for sustainability and how we can go on this bridge to co-design the research. Uh, then we need to have a kind of ethical partnership with the Global South and to really co-design the solution with the people in their territories. And finally, uh, we need to have researchers um, basically to be more reflexive about what are the social countries and how they can maybe think about uh, a new way of doing science. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please uh, email me uh, if you want uh, more um, details and more information about this presentation. And I hope you, are, you will have some fruitful uh, discussion uh, in what uh, follows now. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, Olivier is not here with us. But just as a reminder, he's, uh, he's the chief, um, he's the deputy chief uh, in charge of the sustainability at the IRD. IRD is uh, the research institute uh, that focuses on development in France, and they have uh, many offices, but the headquarters is in Marseille. And um, they are very focusing on uh, trying to understand how to um, use sustainability in, in science, uh, different type of sciences, of course, and how to apply it in investigation and, and different countries. And I think the take-home uh, messages here uh, were quite clear. Uh, we need to uh, work together. We need to use uh, co-designing, applying those uh, sustainable development goals in, in order to have um, a science that is uh, true, fair, as he said. Um, he also uh, mentioned the social contract. Uh, here, I think what was important uh, is uh, sticking for science. Uh, so we heard that this morning, we need to be heard. And uh, when um, something is, is not going on right, uh, we need to stick for the scientists and for the science. Uh, the fake news, I think it's another issue that we need uh, to fight. But uh, overall, I think uh, co-designing, uh, following these uh, SDAGs and the ethics uh, um, is our important theme that uh, need to be followed in, the, in terms of sustainability. So we heard uh, a, a general presentation on the IRD view. Uh, and now we are going to hear from uh, Anna uh, Jesus, who uh, he's a, a, she's a geologist and a researcher in the, in the Institute Don Luis of the Lisbon University. And she's going to talk about her uh, research uh, within an uh, Horizon Europe project. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm very happy to stand here as an alumni of Ma uh, Marie Curie, and I would like to thank the association for uh, uh, inviting me. And so my, my talk uh, would be very technical if I would just be here talking about my project. So my, my main goal is actually to talk about this issue, which is quite pressing nowadays, which has to do with the exploration of critical raw materials. And so, in the end, I will give you an idea of what we are doing in this project, more as an example. And so, I would like to start with this image, so the so-called color stripe graph, uh, which is a very powerful image and a very successful way to convey science to the public on the effects of climate change. If you go to the site of a, a reading university that created this chart, you have data for 200 countries and also the global data, which is more generally portrayed. And I chose Spain, of course, um, which, like my home country, Portugal, is already enduring quite harsh uh, effects of uh, climate change. And so, fortunately, this subject has finally moved from the hallways of academia into the public domain. 
Uh, and so there is now a global effort to tackle this challenge, which is probably one of the biggest one we are going to face uh, as, as a species. And um, for now, the most immediate solution that we have to deal with this uh, is, of course, the so-called green energy transition. So to move away from uh, fossil fuels, energy sources, and from combustion much, um, uh, so vehicles, uh, and to start using other sources of energy, so like solar, like wind, and electrified uh, vehicles. However, um, as you probably have heard, so this is in, in the day's agenda nowadays, um, this kind of technology requires an, an array of chemical elements, of metals, which were not uh, intensively used until now. And so the so-called rare earths, dysprosium, uh, praseodymium, terbium, et cetera, graphite. Um, and so there are challenges also in uh, dealing with these technologies. And if we look at these charts over here, let's see if I can find my mouse, uh, we have here compared, so with different colors, different types of elements, and for the different technologies. And what is here compared is how many kilograms of each material, material you will need to generate one megawatt of energy, for example, for solar uh, or wind power, compared to traditional coal or natural gas. And it's quite plain that we can need up to 15 more uh, million tons per megawatt to put in place these technologies. The same thing happens with vehicles. When we compare a traditional combustion motor a vehicle to an electrical car, we need a much more diverse uh, set of elements and almost 15 times uh, more in terms of amount uh, to build one, one uh, so per vehicle, let's say. Um, and if we put this into perspective, to what are the goals currently to decrease uh, so global emissions. So if we are modest and we stick to the 1.5 to 2 degrees that were agreed uh, in the latest uh, meetings from uh, the, uh, in, in Paris and in Scotland, uh, we can see that overall we would need to generate or to mine 2 million tons more of this kind of very rare raw materials. If we are a bit more ambitious, and we look in 2040 that some countries that have committed to zero uh, emissions and some major companies, then we are talking about like four times. And if we are really ambitious and we go for global uh, net zero emissions by 2050, we are looking at six more times. So we have a problem of how much material and also the type of material that we are needing. And so. If we look at these uh, uh, diagrams we have here showing you how much was being mined, for example, in 2017, and this was a bit before the boom of electrical vehicles, I guess. So we can see this is in million tons, uh, again, over here, that the main commodity that was mined is, of course, iron to make steel and thousands of other applications that we use in our life. And this rectangle over here shows you the rest of the periodic table elements that were being mined. And so part, most of them are the so-called industrial metals that you are probably familiar, like zinc, like uh, copper, uh, chromium, etc. And a very, very tiny fraction, which is this rectangle over here, representing like 0.067% or something, would represent what I will now call these technological metals that we need for the energy transition. And so this combination between availability, demand, has uh, led us to this concept on which, again, the European Union has been pioneering since 2011, which are the so-called critical raw materials. And they include minerals, so metals, but also some organic matters like rubber, cork, uh, for example. And so what we have here in this diagram, I know the numbers are quite small, so is uh, on X, their economic importance, which of course is related with the men, what we were just talking about, and on the Y, uh, the supply risk. And the supply risk is essentially determined by technological factors, geological factors, and geopolitical factors. So what countries are these materials coming? And so anything that projects within this, you can, oh, you cannot see my mouse, can you? So I've been pointing, sorry. <laughs> So anything which is on the quadrant uh, where the dots are painted red is what we consider critical raw materials. And the European Commission, this graphic is published from the raw materials course and is updated every two or three years, 
more or less. And you can see that the, the, the metals which fall in this critical raw material definition are essentially those that I showed initially that we need for the green energy transition. So summing up, critical raw materials are all of those which have a very high economic importance but have a high risk of supply and rupture uh, uh, in terms of supply chain. And so why, what is this geopolitical factors and why, are, why is this so important? Where are these critical raw materials being sourced? So you have here two types. You can look at the map or you can look at the pie chart. It's essentially, they translate you the same. And this is the share of market for different countries supplying these so-called critical raw materials. And it's obvious that so China has uh, the monopoly or is the biggest contributor and completely dominates this kind of market, in particular for the rare earths, which are necessary not only for the vehicles and uh, energy technologies, but for the cell phone, pardon, for the cell phones, for the computers, etc. Okay, followed perhaps by South Africa, which dominates in terms of platinum group elements. Um, which are also produce, produced in Russia, for example, palladium, and Russia is also a major producer of other commodities, including nickel. So actually, my personal opinion is that nickel is going also to be raised in criticality. And, for example, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where most of the cobalt that we use is produced. Um, and so where is the European Union sourcing their critical raw materials of the objects that we use in our day life. Enter the, the, the concept of governance, which has been discussed throughout the day in multiple se uh, sessions. So how do we assess governance? We look at a country and we see how is the freedom of speech? How is social equity? Is there environmental regulation? Um, how is the, the control of corruption? Are the, the regulations being properly enforced? And so what you have in that bar chart on your right is for different commodities, so each line represents a commodity. Um, and we have, so scores in red, of course, are poor governance, and the green is good governance. And what is quite plain is that we in Europe are sourcing most of our critical raw materials in countries which have poor human or environmental standards, which I think is uh, not something we would like to be. And by now, I'm quite sure everybody's thinking, why isn't she talking about recycling? So, of course, recycling and a circular uh, economy is a goal. And, and there's a lot of research and innovation actions which are being funded to improve the technology uh, in recycling and to implement it. So you have in shades of blue uh, how much of a particular element is entering the supply chains via recycling instead of primary mining. And we see that only lead currently reaches 50%, and most of the other metals are quite low, 30 to, to 10, and even lower for some of these metals that we're talking about. So recycling, of course, has some barriers that need to be overcome by increasing research on these topics. Some are related with economic feasibility. We need to be realistic. Nobody is going to uh, have a factory to recycle if they cannot at least pay the the cutoff values of having that factory. There's technological barriers and there's life standing barriers. For example, some materials are trapped in long life structures like buildings or cars. For example, most of the materials, most of the electrical cars are quite new and they will be on the road for still some time. And so European Union has been thinking about these problems for a long time, already since uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, and now with Horizon Europe, and has many calls which aim to improve our resilience to climate change by also having a, a, a responsible sourcing of these critical raw materials. And so the project that I'm currently working on is one of these projects that was financed via Horizon Europe. It's Project Semocrat. And um, so we are studying a particular type of deposits. I will talk about that. So we have a very large uh, multinational and multidisciplinary team involving people both from the academia and from the exploration and mining industry. And we are looking at um, five reference sites from Portugal, Finland, Czech Republic, and uh, two in Poland. Um, and so why do, we, why do I say a particular type of uh, mineral deposits? So this 
typical uh, cross-section that we show to uh, students even in high school, shows you how different uh, metals can occur in different environments, which makes it look quite easy. You know, we just go to a place where we have subduction and we get gold. We just, so, of course, things are not that much linear. But so there's a huge diversity, of course, and we are quite specialized, like everything in science. And in this project, we are looking at magmatic or deposits, meaning that so metals that form from magmas, metals such as vanadium, titanium, chromium, nickel, and uh, platinum. Um, and we are going to employ uh, a theory which is called the mineral system approach, which simplifies the formation of these mineral deposits in three steps, uh, which is we have a source for the metals. So since they are magmatic, of course, the source is the magmas that form from the mantle. And then we have a pathway, the way that these magmas reach up to the crust, where we are, because we cannot reach the mantle, of course. And then we have a sink where these things are deposited. Again, it looks quite simple. The problem is how do we then translate these steps into actual criteria that we can apply. And the objective is to study these uh, so these reference sites that I mentioned, and then improve these models of formation for this particular type of deposits that, so that we can then apply it in other regions um, in Europe. And uh, this is important because the better the models we have uh, in terms of formation on how these metals form, and of course, if you think of all the metals that I've mentioned before, other scientists are doing their share of work on other type of uh, of uh, models, um, and we are also trying to improve the techniques on finding them, so um, what we call exploration. Um, so techniques which are as low impact for populations and for the environment as possible. Uh, and this can be done at a very large area, what we call regional scale, or it can be done at a very local scale, for example, where we have these training sets, these reference cases, and we can for example, look for extensions. So, of course, uh, there is a lot of types of techniques that we are applying, uh, hard rock techniques. So we take a sample, we work it in the lab and do multiple geochemical methods. And I just chose two examples for you to see what is a low impact, uh, which has to do with surface geochemistry. So basically, we're looking for signs that there is a concealed uh, mineral deposit below. And here, for example, soil geochemistry and plant geochemistry. So we have the bedrock and then we have a layer of soil. On top of that, we have plants. And ions of what is in the bedrock are, of course, present in the soil and can be absorbed by the plants. And so we are combining these techniques. So we are just taking these tiny pieces of soil, taking a few leaves, a bit of bark from the trees, depending on what we're looking at, so we can just then understand what signals these kind of uh, concealed deposits may generate. We are also doing a lot of geophysical work. And again, what you are looking uh, on up, up there is a, a, seismic, a seismic station in Lapland, which of course nobody associates to environmental problems, so with forests and reindeers. And so the station is there, it's covered, and it's harming no one. And we are also using airborne geophysics, where we have helicopters flying these things. So they're not emitting. They're just reading what are the natural properties of Earth. So in addition to all of this, we are hoping also to improve reporting codes. Because if we want to keep mining companies in check, that they follow regulations, so governance, we also need good reporting codes. And so we are also trying to contribute and help European Union to have standardized and better codes, more robust, so that companies uphold to this kind of, um, of rules. And finally, uh, one of the things I find more interesting in the project is that so most of us are geoscientists, mathematicals, geophysics, etc. Uh, but we also have social sciences, so we have a social package in our project, which many uh, Horizon Europe projects now also have, so we have social scientists and what they are doing is they are trying to measure the awareness of populations to these questions that I was just presenting. And they do it by having community events where they discuss with the population, where they, we do demonstrations on how we collect rocks or soil or plants, and um, they will build profiles of those communities on those different reference sites, and they also do data mining, which has nothing to do with 
real mining. So basically, they're going into the social networks, Twitter, Facebook, etc., and uh, uh, using machine learning to understand how these matters are perceived by population. And I would like to complete, and going back to the previous presentation, uh, because one of the colleagues once showed us a sentence which I find wonderful, which is, people often opposed to something because they had no agency in planning it. And so this has everything to do with the previous presentation where we need to involve the populations so the social contract needs to be done from the beginning. It's not like when you are about to open a mine that you say, hey, I have a mine, you have to deal with it. So, so we are also trying to improve how these things uh, are perceived by population. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for this concrete uh, example of uh, how sustainability is integrated in a research project and what we need to do, in fact, to, um, to make sure that um, this social contract that uh, I think is an important notion is respected and uh, do we want to transition at any cost? I think this is something that comes out of your presentation. And I don't know if someone here in the audience has a, a particular question that would like to ask Anna. Uh, before we, we move on to Lucy Swan be, because of time, because we are already... Uh, ah, one question from Fernanda. <laughs> I thank you for a very clear, nice presentation. My question is about the, the conflicts that mm. I, I heard very often that you have uh, and your team on this project has been having mm -hmm. with the public or the public has been having with you, especially activists mm -hmm. and how to deal with it. Okay, so just to be clear, we haven't in this project, the project is recent, started in June last year, and we didn't have any problems until now. Um, the, there were some Horizon 2020 projects that had very severe, uh, were very severely impacted uh, by this kind of activism. So they asked uh, the European Commission for disclosure of the grant agreement, which can't, can't be done. And um, ultimately there was some type of leak, nobody really knows how, and they halted the project because they took it to court. And uh, yes, we do have problems sometimes, geologists in some areas. Uh, I was just discussing with, the, with Lucy before lunch. It's starting to be risky because people look at us like uh, a threat, okay? And so, but it has, uh, for you to have a measure in Portugal, for example, we have uh, a lot of lithium uh, er rich areas in the north and we have actually active mines in the south. Okay, what would be basically uh, west of where we are. And there is no problem where we have mines. People are totally okay with mining. They understand it as a sign, so something that brought jobs and development. Of course, the mines are underground, which helps a little bit. But lithium is a f quite fashionable these days. Okay, so uh, Serbia also, for example, said there will be no lithium mining in our territory. And... Um, it's it's really complicated. I mean, the way we try to deal them with, I mean, if is invite them to come, for example, with us to the field, or to be in these community events that are, that our social scientists are doing in this project. We are going to invite all NGOs uh, in the region, which is actually in the south. Uh, but so it's um, it's 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 complex, and uh, well, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to move on with uh, Lucy Swan, uh, who is here today, and he's the, she's the deputy head of the unit in charge of the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions. Uh, we don't need to present her anymore, <laughs> but uh, she will talk about sustainability within uh, the program. And the floor is yours. Um, will this appear?
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, does it appear? Do I need to do anything? Oh. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Technology is not my forte. Uh, anyway, thank you very much um, for inviting me to this session um, and, and for being here in wonderful Cordoba. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, so today, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the European Green Deal which is, let's say, the, uh, the European's uh, sustainable, new sustainable development strategy and how the MSCA uh, contributes to that. Okay. Uh, so you probably know that we're facing um, uh, major interrelated ecological crises. Uh, climate change has already, already been mentioned, pollution, biodiversity loss, and um, unsustainable use of resources. Uh, and in terms of resources, uh, I think um, Anna just, just talked about that. Uh, since 1970, we've tripled uh, uh, the, the annual global extraction of materials. Uh, globally, and it seems like that would uh, grow exponentially uh, if we continue on our path. Uh, in terms of emissions, the EU's industry accounts for 20% of EU's emissions, 90% uh, of biodiversity loss and water stress comes from resource extraction and pro processing, uh, and only 12% of the materials used by EU industry comes from recycling. Another part of the challenge is, of course, pollution, uh, which is uh, the biggest environmental health risk in Europe, causing eight, uh, 400,000 deaths per year. And only 40% of the surface water bodies in Europe have a good ecological status. Uh, so, uh, the, what's the EU's response to that? Well, the EU has, has clearly been working on environmental policy for many years, but uh, the von der Leyen Commission, um, uh, so President von der Leyen and her commission, which came in 2019, uh, set a number of priorities, and the number one priority is called a European Green Deal. Uh, and the European Green Deal is the EU's roadmap for making uh, the EU's economy sustainable. So what is the main goal? The main goal is to make um, uh, the EU the first uh, climate neutral continent before 2050. Um, the, some of the relevant targets are cutting emissions by at least 55% below 1990 levels by 2030. And that's now been enshrined in the European climate law. Uh, the purpose is also to stimulate the creation of green jobs, uh, to ensure that the transition is fair and leaves no one behind and to protect the health and well-being of citizens from an environment-related environment risks. So the European Green Deal is really the, the new growth strategy of the European Union. Uh, it proposes integrated solutions covering all the different areas. Um, so there's the circular economy, uh, biodiversity strategy, zero pollution ambition, and climate action, which all um, uh, fit together in this jigsaw. Uh, and these are the building blocks for the Green Deal. So um, it's about designing a set of deeply transformative policies um, 
in uh, a, vast a, a, a vast set of areas from sustainable transport, green industry, eliminating pollution, um, protecting nature, uh, farming and agriculture, uh, making homes more energy efficient, uh, and so on. And so the purpose is really to transform the EU's economy for a sustainable uh, future. And that's done by mainstreaming sustainability in all EU policies. And uh, one of those, which is more than policy, is mobilizing research and innovation. So I'm coming to that now. Uh, so that's a really important building block for the, for the European Green Deal. Um, with 35% of Horizon Europe funding uh, dedicated to climate action. That's 33 billion over the seven year period. Um, in Horizon 2020, there was a very big Green Deal call uh, worth 1 billion euro. Uh, we have under Horizon uh, four of the five missions relate to the Green Deal. Climate adaptation, ocean, cities and soil. Uh, many of the European partnerships with industry and member states are focusing uh, on the Green Deal as well. Uh, so the idea is really for research and innovation to drive, navigate and accelerate the twin green and digital transitions and to be able to develop, demonstrate and deploy solutions widely and at scale. Uh, so the EU really counts as investing on research and innovation in order for it to play a key role in helping Europe achieve climate neutrality by 2050. So uh, a lot of the burden is on, <laughs> is on researchers. So these are the, the Green Deal uh, missions, uh, which I mentioned, adaptation to climate change, uh, climate neutral and smart cities, soil health and food, and healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters. The fifth mission is linked uh, also, of course, because it's related to cancer. Um, now, moving to the MSCA. So, how does the MSCA contribute to the, uh, the European Green Deal? Well, first, in terms of projects, um, uh, project content, so MSCA projects focusing on sustainability. Um, so there's 900 approximately projects that are directly contributing to the European Green, Green Deal. Um, but as Themis Christofidou said this morning, there are many, many more that contribute indirectly. In fact, the vast majority of them somehow are connected indirectly to uh, sustainable development. Um, and here, what's really important, so there's so many projects working on this, uh, but it's very important to ensure the exploitation uh, and valorization and dissemination of those results and to ensure that those results feed into policy. And then there's another uh, element uh, in terms of the MSCA contribution to the Green Deal, and that is not only in the content of projects, but in how projects are implemented. And here, every single MSCA project can contri contribute to, to this, and that's ensuring sustainability in the project implementation. And for this, we've developed uh, what we call the MSCA Green Charter, uh, which aims to provides guidance on how to ensure um, more sustainable uh, ways of managing projects, and I'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, and it includes good guidance material uh, uh, on the MSCA website, but I'll mention that in, in more detail later. Uh, so coming back to projects focusing on, um, on the Green Deal, uh, and in particular on what we do in terms of feedback to policy, uh, we organized uh, what we call a, a, a cluster event. Uh, in fact, we've organized several on, on different themes, but we've had one specifically on the European Green Deal, which took place in July 2021. Um, and the purpose of, of this event was to showcase a number of MSCA projects. So 69 projects were selected specifically um, out of over 500 that had been identified. Uh, and covering biodiversity, sustainable agri agriculture and soil health, clean energy, green transport, eliminating pollution and climate action. Uh, and the purpose was to, first of all, showcase the excellence of MSCA researchers and their contribution to the Green Deal, to provide input to EU policymaking, um, and explore how, how research and innovation can help achieve the goals of the European Green Deal and also to enhance synergies among EU-funded projects and to stimulate networking opportunities. 
so I, I really recommend going to check. I've, I've put the link here. Um, it's worth checking the, the report from, uh, uh, from this event and the interesting projects that were presented. Uh, here, I've just given one of the one of the uh, an example of a project which um, um, created a, a transnational research network focused on on the challenge of unwanted pesticides in the environment. Uh, but there are many, uh, many, many more uh, very interesting projects. Uh, now, coming a little bit to the other side of MSCA, because of course those projects are very much aware of the Green Deal and the importance of. Um, of, uh, of addressing environmental impacts. Um, but across the whole spectrum of MSCA projects, uh, the awareness is probably not that great. Um, if we look at the uh, MCAA uh, major survey um, from October 2020, so here the awareness of the European Green Deal um, was, well, kind of 50-50, and measures uh, to reduce environmental impacts and promote sustainable action at project level. Um, again, this was, I think, 30%, 36% said that there were measures in place. Um, many said there weren't, and uh, a good proportion did not know. Uh, now, we've compared this to the initial results we've had from the 2022 uh, survey. Um, and here the awareness of the Green Deal hasn't really increased that much, which shows I think the European Commission has maybe more to do in, in raising awareness of, um, of its major priority. Um, secondly, awareness of the, the MSCA Green Charter. Well, this is quite new, the MSCA Green Charter is from 2021, so um, again, maybe not, uh, not all alumni are aware of this. Um, but so far, 21% uh, said they were. I think there's, there's, there's room to, to raise more awareness of the Green Charter. Uh, and then in terms of measures to reduce the environmental impact and promote sustainable action, um, here the figures are interesting because the, the number who answered yes has gone down, um, but the, the number who answered I don't know has, has really shot up. Uh, so maybe there are measures in place to reduce the environmental impact, but you know the researchers are not are not uh, are not aware of it or not sure about it. Anyway, it shows there is some room uh, some room for improvement. So this is the MSCA Green Charter. Uh, I've included the 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 link there. Uh, and basically, the idea of the Green Charter is to encourage all MSCA funded projects across the spectrum to, to address these principles and implement measures to minimize the environmental footprint of their activities. Um, so this includes several recommendations and principles, uh, such as minimizing the production uh, of waste and harmful substances, prioritizing low carbon forms of transport for all project related travel, um, employing teleconferencing tools where possible, uh, the, the guidance is also directed both at researchers themselves and at the institutions. Uh, so there's a whole series of, um, of, of guidance and, and principles that are in there. So I really um, urge you to, to have a look. Uh, then we also have provided guidance material um, uh, in terms of, for example, there's European Commission guidelines for the organization of sustainable events. Uh, I'm not sure if I sent this to MCAA <laughs> before they organized the conference, <laughs> but these are just things that maybe one doesn't automatically think about. But I think once, you know, I think we all have a, a role to play in, in, in reaching these objectives of the Green Deal. And so every single person individually can do that through organizations and through... So one, one of the um, guidelines is as regards hotels, hotels that maybe have eco-label or AMAS, um, registering for the eco-management and audit scheme, uh, implementing the European Commission's green public procurement guidelines. So there's a whole host of, um, of guidelines that is wor worth, worth looking at. Um, there's also some um, good practices from um, various universities and research institutes who have already published um, good, practice, good practices for greening, greening their research. Uh, 
So I recommend, yeah, having a look at, at the charter and those guidelines. Now, in terms of the implementation of the MSCA projects, so uh, the MSCA Green Charter is not mentioned in the evaluation criteria. So far, what we do is, um, uh, for doctoral networks and staff exchange, uh, we ask at the time of application whether um, uh, the applicant is, intends to implement the Green Charter. Uh, this is going to be broadened um, to all the actions um, this year uh, in order to get a feel. It's not, not obligatory, but it's uh, to raise awareness first of all and also to encourage organisations to, to implement the Green Charter and for those that do, to have information on how they do it. Um, so evaluators, in terms of the evaluation, as I said, it's not, it's not included, but evaluators are aware of the charter. Um, and so mentioning the charter will not need to extra points unless the applicants clearly demonstrate how it contributes to strengthen their project. Um, and as I mentioned, it will be mentioned in all proposal templates. Uh, and we're doing more to raise awareness and uh, uh, maybe we can work also with MCAA to, to um, to further raise awareness of the charter and guidelines. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have to wrap up uh, very soon the session, but uh, I guess I will have uh, one question for you before that. Um, how could we better exploit the results of uh, the MC MSCA projects uh, to maximize the, the impact uh, in general? So I think that's a, it's a very good question because uh, we have so much material there, there's so many results. Um, uh, so what we do already is we, we do try and raise awareness of it through our MSCA newsletter, through social media, through Cordis. Um, there's a, a number of tools uh, in order to, to make people aware of success stories, but um, we need to do more. What we intend to do this year, in fact, we're going to be launching uh, a new initiative, um, a new project, in fact, called Feedback to Policy. And, and the aim, and it's in fact particularly focusing on the mission, so particularly on the Green Deal. Uh, so the aim is really to try and um, bring out the results of projects, bring them together, and try and see how they can feed back into policy, but also how they can feed into, um, um, well, how, how we can exploit them and maximize the impact of those results. Um, so we also do it through the cluster events. So we're trying to do more and more to try and um, really bring out the results of those projects and make sure that they, they, they then come to good use and, um, and either feed into policy or then um, are, are used for startups or... Queen society in general. Yeah. Great. I don't know if anyone has a last question in the audience for Lucy. No. Okay, thank you very much to all our speakers, one more time. And um, it's a wrap up. <laughs>